I think it's about that age that myself, like many people, start becoming more aware of the ways of the world, of just mm-hmm. many different beliefs, many different um, things that people say is true or not true, right or not mm-hmm. right, and almost a sense of, well, how do I know that God exists? How do I know that what he's teaching and the things that I'm learning, how do I know that these are true? Um, Hey, everybody. This is the Grace Chronicles. I'm Sherry Falco in New York, and I'm here with my co-host, Jeff Wadoff. And our guest today is Father Bill from Nebraska. And he has a testimony about encountering Christ in the community of believers. So good to be with you and so good to be with everyone here. Such a blessing. So you are just, you have an incredibly unique testimony. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering, you know, where you'd like to begin in sharing with our listeners. Yeah, I think uh, just throughout life, I think it's been a story of knowing Jesus, maybe beginning on more of a surface level, but just throughout the years coming to know him more and more, um, being led toward priesthood and, and in the Catholic Church, and also just seeing unity in believers. I know it was just about a year ago we were all in Brazil being able to minister to so many Christians there. So it's exciting that we can uh, just be together again and just rejoice in how Christ has led us. Um, well, you know what? You mentioned a couple things. Number one, I think some people think, well, I accepted Christ, so that's it. But it's really a journey. And then the other thing you mentioned, and I'm glad you're going to mention these things, is, oh, Protestant versus Catholic thing. So let's go. So how, yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, so I grew up, um, I mean, I always grew up Catholic. And just with family, we went to church every weekend. And then we have a lot of Catholic schools in our area. So I was blessed to um, go to those schools um, from kindergarten upward. Uh, so grade school and high school. And um, just going to that, I mean, with mass each weekend eventually as I grew older. Like, I'm sure there's many <laughs> stories about oh, those who are altar servers yeah. and that serving at the altar. So a lot of kids love doing that. And to be able to um, do that with some, with some really good priests, um, being able to help sing at mass um, and help canter with my sister. Uh, it's one of those things, too. My parents always and my grandparents always wanted me to be reverent. So it's mm. like, well, point your fingers up to heaven. It's where you want to go. <laughs> and having that, I think myself, I think I was, I've always been more of like, OK, obedience one and more of the okay, wanting to follow orders exactly, wanting to mm. uh, be perfect in that sense. So just being reverent and being grace filled and appreciating the religion classes that we had in school. Um, but then I think there was always just this relationship with the Lord, but sometimes not as deep, but sometimes deeper than other things. So, yeah, that's what I was going to ask you, because, you know, so your parents want this, your grandparents want this, you grow up with this. Mm-hmm. And so how is your relationship with God at this point? Yeah, I'd say it's recognizing like, OK, praying to him, like praying at meals and other times, but there wasn't like. We didn't have these extended times of prayer or these yeah. reading the Bible like on our own um, kinds of things. So I think there was the prayers are more on just a vocal level, like yeah. the vocal prayers rather than um, more of the heart relationship. When, so now, when did you first become aware, I'll say, of the presence of God? Like when did it kind of switch over from just something you do to, oh, yeah, he's really there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think because I think there was always like okay some general awareness of of God's presence. Um, like I remember like celebrating some of the big things like First Communion or serving at Mass for the first time or um, just times being with others with my family. Um, but I think on the deeper heart level that came. Um, so just so we finished like like grade school and then I move over to the junior high in town and I think it's about that age that myself like many people start becoming more aware of the ways of the world of just Mm -hmm. many different beliefs many different um things that people say is true or not true right or not Mm -hmm. right and almost a sense of well how do I know that God exists how do I know that what he's teaching and the things I'm learning how do I know that these are true um, so I remember even being in seventh grade, um, being more intellectual, I was read the Da Vinci Code. 
of course, is quite an out there story of different things, but it's almost like, okay, put that doubt into my mind of what's really true. And then sometime after that, I read the Left Behind series. I just started with the teen series, just looked like nice books on the library shelf, and I remember reading the first I think the first portion of the first book and one thing to talk about was this deeper relationship with Jesus giving your life to Jesus and I think more out of fear rather than trust I was some did the prayer like giving myself to Christ but what it did do is like and throughout reading that book and other things it's seeing this deeper personal relationship with the Lord and having that emphasized through theology classes that I was taking throughout school um, and just really good priests that were teaching and helping helping us grow. Because eighth grade is like the, as with Catholics, we have the sacrament of confirmation. And that's given at different ages depending on the location. But it's meant to be like the strengthening of the Holy Spirit, the, like a, the laying on of hands and praying for the gifts of the Spirit and the trust in the Lord. And so I had that in the May of my eighth grade year. And it was a good experience. And I remember... After, distinctly afterward, I was looking in the bathroom mirror, and I had this thought come into my mind. Okay, well, what's what's next? Because there's a lot of emphasis in preparing for this confirmation, but what's next coming after this? So, and I think many of my classmates were probably in the same boat at that time. And so what that led to is that there was this retreat that was taking place on that summer. So it's a retreat called JC Camp. It's uh, um, just a time of prayer and faith for incoming high school students and then other students serve as junior counselors and then adults um, help lead and guide discussions. And just that happening in this really beautiful retreat center in the middle of the country. And go, I was going on this and at first time I just, my parents were pretty hesitant to let me go at first and I was pretty hesitant about being away from home for that long, but eventually decided to go for it. And, um, so it was, what it did during that time, I remember there was the first nights that we had. And that fact, before that, there was a mass we celebrated, and the priest preached on the reading happened to be Ezekiel, um, where he says, I will take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And the priest in his homily said, God wants to break your heart. He wants to break that heart of stone. He wants to break um, that and replace it with his heart, with his flesh. And that night when we got out, there was a middle uh there's a hill area where there's a fire pit for a campfire and we were all seated around there and the main leader just invited everyone to be silent for a while and just take everything in just take in the sounds of nature so i remember sitting there and just looking upon this beautiful valley looking upon the trees the plants everything beautiful there hearing the sound of the insects the animals on the sky with some clouds above and just this really beautiful seen. And of course, I mean, before that, I'd read about different arguments for the existence of God, the arguments of creation, the cause and effect of the various, okay, from the universe, like that, this couldn't have come on its own. And that moment, I think, actualized it within me in the sense of, like, really, all of this truly is dependent, truly is gift in the Lord. And from, so just this beautiful silence, and then from that silence, the leader began reading um, from Romans chapter 10, saying that for the Lord is near you in your mouth and in your heart. For if you proclaim that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. And just from then and the rest of the conversation that night at the campfire, just really welling up and saying, hey, this is, what, this is my invitation to follow Christ, an invitation to follow him more deeply and sensing him speaking just through the silence, through the prayer, through the faith, and through the love. I think the because another thing with along with the doubts, the intellectual more of a there been more of a loneliness of that time, loneliness and sense of feeling different from my classmates, and not having as many opportunities to um, grow and um, win friendships with them. But then through just the time of being at that retreat and being with my classmates on this real way, I mean no masks, no barriers, just like just be with each other in, in God. That was a powerful experience of, of just so helping me begin growing in those friendships. And so just everything with that in the time of prayer just opened up my eyes and my heart to new levels of faith, um, deeper awareness of this.
Well, you know, it's interesting because you started with the part where, you know, you were struggling a little bit. You're reading the Da Vinci Code, then you read Left Behind, and you're like, yeah, I better just go this. And, you know, I think it's really important, you know, even for people who grow up, right, in a, in a Christian home, that they decide what they really believe that they really wrestle with it and just make the, because it is about a relationship. You keep saying a deeper relationship. So you seem like you have the one piece and then this retreat, right? Right. When God is actually, it sounds like breaking your heart of stone and giving you a heart of flesh, right? That you become, and it's two things you mentioned that are interesting. One is about the prayer and the reflection and the silence. And the other thing is about the community that's around you. So two things are happening to help deepen your faith. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think the, so from prayer and silence, so the prayer of taking time with God. And so, and having done that in the past, and I think even leading up to that, something that I'd begun doing was, like reading a chapter of the New Testament each day. And I think that helped get prime the pump for that deeper prayer. I think at the camp, learning and through just different opportunities, learning how can I pray on that deeper level in faith. And so that, I think, well, I'll t speak more on that I think in a bit as I deepen the journey. Uh, but then the friendships, like saying, okay, I'm able to be with others in, in Christ and loving each other authentically, and caring for one another, affirming each other. I think that's beautiful. One of the practices at this camp, there everyone gets a Bible, and then um, you can write notes to each other within that Bible. And I still, I still have that. In fact, I think it was just a few weeks ago, I was going through some desolation, and I just opened that Bible up again just to say, hey, how can I, like, knowing okay, what is true in here, of course, God's word itself, but also his word spoken through others. And it's really beautiful to return to that, to those moments, to those memories, those graces, um, to be able to say that there's, yeah, there's a lot more here. Um, so I think that began a journey that would continue um, throughout school and beyond. So at what point, because I think, listen, so, <laughs> just me, like my mom was Catholic. And whenever I would look at the priests, I would just think they were born that way. They just like were always that way. They were always that mature. And they were this mysterious like figure that I could never quite understand. So when did you decide to become a priest and what was your journey? Yeah, yeah. so just a, yeah, I guess continuing the story because I had that retreat and, and just a really good, like my pastor who was at the church um, was just a bit older, but was very humble, very approachable. And then the teacher at the school um, was just very intelligent, very bright, and he also helped with the theater department, um, so I got to have that. And then there was another priest who came in um, my sophomore year, and he was fresh out of seminary, and just really um, just an awesome influence for, for myself and so many others in the school, because again, he was down to earth, relatable, but also had a lot of wisdom that was present. And so I think for myself, like uh, the priest, it would be this, like, idea like because growing up of course again hands folded like this and participating <laughs> in mass the older ladies in the church are about to say oh you should be a priest <laughs> i never really accepted like accepted that i mean there was sometimes i thought about it but other times I'm like no, not really and but in fact one of the things my grandfather um on my, my that mom's dad um he went to seminary i think for about 10 years like from beginning after into high school there had high school seminaries at the time then joined the franciscans and but then left before he made his final vows so my young mind always thought well if god makes me a priest that's divine revenge of my grandfather for leaving yeah. seminary <laughs> so i had never had this instinct of like no i didn't want that but then like so freshman after that retreat freshman year was good like growing in faith but not perfect and there were still some roadblocks along the way i still felt like a good amount of loneliness but had it like a, a more of a passion, like seeking out like, truth, like starting to read more books on faith, watching um, more t TV shows about just about the church, about the teaching, and also Christian music being really big. Um, 
I think I discovered bands like DC Talk or Toby Mac or Switchfoot or Skillet and all these bands that are just, I mean, just really, really awesome, great music, but also the great message as well. And, and even this is that Christian unity. I think it's about myself being to see, receive so much from that. And so before sophomore year, I went back to this retreat to JC camp and I went to Sacrament of Confession. I'll just make green my sins before the priest and the person of Christ. But the priest that went somewhat off script and asked me directly, now I, I did not know this priest. I don't know how he knew me. And I think this is more of an inspiration that he had because he asked me, well, have you ever thought about being a priest? And I said, well, a little bit, but not really. And he's like, well, maybe to just continue praying about it and be open. And so as I went out to the chapel and prayed, um, just a lot of gratitude to God for forgiveness, but also like sensing, oh, maybe there is an interior desire. Maybe there is like this interior thought, this tug toward priesthood. Um, but I think it was too early to really discern much about it. So I thought, well, I'll just somewhat put this to the back and think about this later. And but one of the great things that came too from that retreat is that several friends and I decided that we didn't want this to like fade away. Because I think the common temptation is that you attend a retreat, you attend something awesome, you have a consoling moment of Christ, and then over time the feelings fade, the memories fade, and sometimes the yeah. habits fade along with that. So some friends and I decided you know, we wanted to continue supporting each other. So we tried um, as much as we could each week to meet together, pray together, um, studied the Bible, talked about our faith, just invited others to do the same with us. And it was just a really powerful time. And so, again, addressing the doubts by giving, or for me, addressing the doubts of, of what's true or not, be able to more deeply study these things, but also addressing the loneliness and sharing me these are friends that I can truly count on care for and they care for me and helping each other grow in this holiness and so that was just really powerful throughout the couple of years we did so and then it morphed also into a friend who played guitar um, started doing these uh, holy hours of, at the church just praising the lord and praising him um, and missed that and i i joined it along with him and being a percussionist i found a set of bongos on ebay and started uh, joining with him through that but again those years that we were we did that we were just so so blessed of helping us pray and helping us lead others in prayer as well. And so all those things then, so as I'm exploring that and it's still the thought of priesthood comes coming up every once in a while and um, sometimes bringing out consolation, like, oh, maybe this is the Lord's calling, but sometimes the desolation of like, no, I definitely don't want that. It's like, I, I, because I think the, the big thing was the fear of failure. I think we're all super aware of the scandals that um, have come from priests in recent years. And I think I would see that and someone be afraid of, yeah, I don't want to just enter into something and then fall from, mm -hmm. from that place. And so just the, the fear of losing everything. I think the, in the midst of those things, I think there were still the consoling moments of God affirming why I was in him, and that's love, and this truth. And eventually I was invited to visit a seminary, a seminary in the middle of the country in northwest Missouri and run by Benedictine monks and this really peaceful place and seeing getting to know the men there who were in formation for priesthood and getting to know some of the monks who were leading that and just again so truth okay knowing the truth of faith but also love community that's present there and there was just a lot of peace that um I think when I would think about that time like the future weeks there was a lot of peace that kept coming and I think that led to just one of the key the key moments then of the yes and also the conversion of faith. I just love how you continually come back to the community of love. Mm -hmm. Because particularly because I think most people, even I mean, I think of it. So I mean, I don't know what it would like be like to be a priest. But I guess in my mind, I would think, oh, I, that's lonely. And, you know, there are a lot of people who think they can do their journey with Christ alone. They're like, oh, I don't need to go to church. I don't need other believers. I can do this by myself, just he and I. 
But throughout your whole story is this undercurrent of, yes, it's a community of love. Yes, it's Jesus and I, but the context is this community of love. And I really like that you keep bringing it out because this is sounds like it's an integral part of your journey. Yeah, for sure. It goes us just a close friend of mine in seminary, his key phrase is like our whole purpose as placed by God is to love and to be loved. Mm -hmm. I think as for myself, I tend to overcomplicate things a lot of times and be like, oh, I have to get these, like I'm very perfectionistic. Right? I need to get these things right and these things in place and then I can be loved. Mm -hmm. But the reality of faith is saying, no, God loves you even before you do any of those things or don't do any of those things. At the moment of Jesus' baptism, of course, from all eternity, being son of God, but the father saying, you are my beloved son, if you ain't well pleased. It's before Jesus did any of his ministry. He had the A plus before he began the test. Yeah. <laughs> but knowing there's the faith that I think for, for myself, again, encountering that again and again. Um, and where that truly came, the moment I was referencing before, so before my senior year of high school, I was back at this retreat back at the retreat center and it was during mass on Saturday. Um, I don't really remember what the readings were or anything leading up to that, but just remember there's, so there's the song that was played um, during the moment of offertory, the moment that the bread and wine are brought to the altar and they prepare for the Eucharist. But the priest, say, or uh, just the offertory hymn was a hymn called You Are Mine, which mm. is pretty well known um, in some Catholic church circles, but it's a, it's a, Citing Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1. Do not be afraid. I am with you. I have called you each by name. Come and follow me. I will bring you home. I love you. and You are mine. And so I remember even as that song began, I just remember thinking in my head, like, oh, no. But because as we sing that, it's like those words, and especially the verses, that's like God speaking directly to us but i felt like god speaking directly to me saying bill do not be afraid i'm with you bill i have called you i love you you are mine and as i'm receiving that's just resonating so deeply in my heart um and then just bringing a lot of peace and it's overflowing into tears and to weeping um, throughout the rest of the mass and even afterward tears of this joy and this love of saying that i'm given this love and and because I am fully God's, because God has called me his, then I can then I can give my life back to him. And what that meant at the time is that, God, if you are calling me to seminary, which it seems like you are, then I say yes. Then I say yes to following in you. And that's where just then the peace somewhat flowed from that and began to claim that then is God's calling, is his presence in my life. And and so that just developed then through various events throughout that senior year and applying for seminary and you know, just being accepted for that and then entering into seminary that following fall. I think, again, always coming back to that relationship. Okay, I was called in that moment, but it wasn't just become a priest and I'll love you, but it's I love you and I'm leading you in this direction. Yeah. Okay, so the... I think that's, that's love, really yeah. important is that... <laughs> People are like, oh, what's my purpose? What am I supposed to do? But the love comes first, right? That's that's where our identity is. And then purpose comes out of that. And so I like that you brought that out as I love you, you're mine. And then here we go with, here we, with the calling, right. right? So the love wasn't at all contingent on you being a priest. It's not like I'm going to be a priest right. and God's going to love yeah, me. I think and, if I, and if I miss it, he's not going to love me. It's I know he loves me. And because he loves me, we're going to take this journey together. That, that the second thing I heard was, so you've got them reciting Isaiah 43. And it's, it's like it, the Bible is now not just a book God's talking to everybody, but he's talking to you. Those, those aren't just verses, you know, for the world. That's God is speaking directly to you. So now the Bible becomes personal in that regard. Okay. And the third thing I got, and I, I, I want to go back to this, Sherry mentioned it, is 
the importance of community. Because it's, you, you have, we all have unique challenges and being a priest has its unique challenges, <laughs> but nobody can live Christianity out in isolation. None of us can do it. And we're not supposed to do it. And we're not designed to do it. And we're supposed to gain strength from each other. And it seems like early on, you recognize the importance of that. Yeah, I think recognizing the importance and then the gradual fulfillment of that. And okay. cause even as I went to seminary in those first four years, the I mean, just be having some really good classmates that we just developed stronger friendships. And what they did was challenge me to not just live on that surface level, but to go deeper into friendship, into this relationship with God and then with those around me. And that, as I said, the purpose of love, the purpose of grace, talking about those deep topics and not being afraid to maybe go deeper into those places in me which were not touched by the gospel, which are not illuminated by Christ. The perfectionism of saying, oh, I need to get all this totally perfect. Like I would worry about or get upset if I missed a couple questions on the assignments, on the homework assignments, or um, didn't fulfill one's expectations. Just again, right, trying to impress others rather than like, living from that love of God. So my friends were so good about bringing me back to that. Um, just in times of Really realizing, um, yeah, I can't do this on my own. No, I need God, God's love, and I need Him. I need to surrender myself even more to Him. Um, so just encountering that, and I think that's continuing to be shed. I still have those tendencies sometimes, get self-reliance rather than fully surrendering to Him. And yet, by His grace, it's become more, more and more easier to give that surrender, to give that love. Doing so with others and those and those friendships and and even now of serving as a priest, but also just as a, as a brother as well for those friends that I'm with and um, families that I've gotten to know well. And yeah, it's definitely not a lonely life because it's seeing the love of encountering that from so many and from brother priests as well um, that were intentional about taking that time with each other, um, supporting each other. Um, there's a group of priests I meet with about once a month and just being able to share share our lives together, share what's been going on, but also just the time of being with each other and then other friends that I've gotten to know in that deeper way too. And you're, I mean, you mentioned at the beginning that we met in Brazil right. <laughs> where we saw some crazy miracles. <laughs> and um, so can you just tell me, because you are... How do I want to put it? Your community extends beyond the Catholic Church to the entire body of Christ. So can you just tell us how that happened? Because here you are headed for the priesthood. You're in seminary. Then somewhere along the line, God expands this <laughs> to be bigger. Yeah, it's, it's me like thinking again how it happened. I mean, from, well, from Left Behind series beginning, but then also Christian music and becoming more deeply into um, to that world, um, receiving that, sharing that with friends. Um, and then, that, so it's seeing okay, the fruit that's coming and Christians coming together. And I think always having that emphasis on the Holy Spirit, um, the praying, like that, this retreat, one of the common things is the praying with each other, having a prayer team, um, intercessory prayer. And then throughout seminary, my friends were very much in that same mindset. Um, I remember during one, one time we went to a Bethel music concert that was that was close by. And so that was the first time I'd seen like a healing service like that in person. And then when I went to, so the first four years there, and then the second four years, I was uh, in St. Louis, Missouri, um, in school that, that um, literally that was open to all that as well. We, there would be a prayer group each Monday night. Not too, many, not too many of us, but just a time of praise and worship and a time of teaching. We went through a Life in the Spirit seminar, and then we're able to share that with others. Um, but that was the first time I really heard the term baptized in the Holy Spirit, and to really see that. What it is is this activating of graces that God gives. Okay, I'm going to stop you for a second. <laughs> so, because a lot of our listeners will not know what you're talking about. So, first of all, can you say something about who the Holy Spirit is? 
and what it means when you say baptism in the Holy Spirit. Okay. Yeah, so the Holy Spirit is as we, the love of the Father and the Son. So we don't believe that God is Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so we see the Holy Spirit descending on Jesus at the, his baptism, and then being poured out on the apostles as well. And so that's this Holy Spirit whose life, who's a, third, who's a person of God, and the life of the Trinity, and then living within us, along with the Father and the Son. And the Holy Spirit is known throughout Scripture as pouring out gifts of the Spirit. Um, what Isaiah, we see wisdom, counsel, knowledge, understanding, and then, then St. Paul saying, there's the charisms, the gifts of the Spirit, knowledge, and healing, and prophecy, and wisdom, and administration, and many others. So the Holy Spirit giving those gifts, so that, that is life. And that Jesus says one of the missions that he has is to bring baptism in the Holy Spirit. As John the Baptist said, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. So meaning that not just into like just simple salvation, but that God wants to dwell within us and he wants to pour his graces through us. So a baptism meaning immersion in the Holy Spirit. And so saying that there's moments within our Christian life, as I think I've experienced several times down the road, but now being able to put this more conscious term to it was mm -hmm. saying that there's this life in the Holy Spirit that I can continue to say yes to and continue to surrender myself to. And so I think through the prayer group at the seminary and through other opportunities that there's this just continued yes that I was able to make and beginning to see some of those deeper gifts coming more alive in my faith and more alive in his church. So when, so you're on this journey and the baptism of the Holy Spirit brings more of his love, more of his power, more of his presence. Would that be a fair statement? Mm hmm yeah, and that I think there's there's always more. Yes, <laughs> That's what Randy Clark would say. And then being able to see that within my own life, and especially after I so I did seminary and then became a priest in 2019, five years ago, and then came to the parishes where I'm at, where I serve as associate pastor. And my pastor is very much of the same mindset of the Holy Spirit and being raised in many of these movements and. You know, soon after that, we learned of a group um, called Encounter Ministries that um, was really inspired by Global Awakening, um, but just focus on spiritual gifts within the church and, and bringing this alive even more in the Catholic Church. So my pastor heard about them and signed us up for a conference that they were going to be having in Ohio. And so I went, and this really, really was an awesome time of, I get some things I had never quite seen before in terms of like a full healing service or in terms of the prophetic gifts of how, what does it mean to speak prophecy? So sometimes there can be this underlying mindset um, that says, okay, God did those miracles back then, or he does so with um, super saints, yeah. but he doesn't necessarily do so as much through regular people. And yet realizing through this and many other things, no, God still wants to work. He shares his love these different ways. He shares his love through healings, through graces, through encouraging words, through prophecy, um, through the community of believers. And being able to see the influence of this, because as I mentioned, Encounter being so influenced by Randy Clark and Global Awakening, and that's what launched me more into, into this world of okay, all of us Christians coming together in faith to learn more about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, to see the unity of faith that comes to pray together, to praise together, and to know that this is what's bringing this unity, what's bringing this faith in the church. So a couple of things. I think a really important point is, you know, people who say, well, God doesn't heal anymore, right? But when you said, but the healing is really a manifestation of his love. When he heals, it's really one way of it is the gospel saying you know i love you therefore that's what jesus did right he's moved by compassion so i just wanted to bring that out because that's something that you said in passing and then how would you say that your experience because you know jesus's desire is that we be unified you know, we don't have to agree 100% of the time with everyone's theology. Yes, we have to agree about the main things. 
but how would you say it's made your your life richer or you know than it would be without it yeah no it's become tremendously rich and tremendously gifted of coming into these communities into these contexts of studies that i'm doing of these different conferences and groups classes where i think there's the mutual exchange that can and does take place on the sharing of god's gifts and that i can receive this emphasis this teaching of the gifts of the holy spirit and then pass this on to my parishioners to my students and then i can also share and respond when questions about the Catholic Church come up and the sacraments mm -hmm. or about the life of this given to us in Christ or and the role of the saints, of Mary, of the richness of devotion to be able to say that and so shed the light, of course, recognizing the abuses and history that have happened mm -hmm. and also saying, here's the richness of tradition that we can bring, that we can share. And, just the, and then the personal friendships as well. Um, just that we're devoted in this prayer together, in this searching for wisdom together, and receiving God's graces together. Um, this time so, of prayer together have been so rich and powerful, and then I can bring that back into my ministry, into my faith, and using resources and using, I mean, I'm a reader, of course, so I have plenty of books um, from many different Christian authors that have been so influential for me, and then being able to help to see the influences has and what I can share then as, as I preach, as I teach, and then pray with people as well. I think that's the beautiful part about priesthood is just being able to pray with many people in those contexts and being able to share what I've received um, with those. And so just very much this fullness of the gospel is one of my favorite scripture passages, Ephesians chapter 3. Um, so our St. Paul's prayer for the readers, verses 14 to 21. And he says that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And I think I keep coming back to that because realizing that God's fullness is infinite. It's infinite love. And that as I'm receiving this, I'm able then to be a reservoir of this for others, be a stream of this life. And knowing that the fullness goes beyond like, visible boundaries or goes beyond just one thing or one aspect of faith. And it continues all throughout the gospel and all throughout the faith. And and it's exciting for me to see these gifts of the Holy Spirit coming more alive in the Catholic Church and, and brother priests who, are, who have also discovered these riches that we're able to assist each other. Um, that we meet together here in this area every so often to share in these blessings. And then also um, seeing this coming alive even more in the unity of faith that's, that's being enriched through this. You've been really, really transparent and humble as far as... Uh your own struggles and some things in the church. So I'm going to ask you a hard question. So I'm going to spring on you. <laughs> um, what would you say to people who have been hurt either by the Catholic church or by clergy? I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's it hitting the headlines. It doesn't matter. Protestant Catholic, it doesn't matter. So what would you say to those people who have walked away from Christ and walked away from the church because they've been hurt? within the church. Yeah, I think the first thing I say is I'm sorry it happened to you. I'm sorry that someone, whether a leader or a priest or just another parishioner, that someone stepped outside of their bounds of who God was calling them in to that love, but abused that trust or abused that power. And the pain that uh, that's being experienced, that you've experienced or continue to experience is I'm sure it's excruciating. So that Jesus himself on the cross experienced that. He experienced the rejection. He experienced the abuse from leaders at that time and experiences that with each one of us. And that it does call us as leaders in the church to humility, to that asking for forgiveness, for continued forgiveness and for asking to grow in that trust again and asking to help us as leaders share the fullness of the gospel to live in that love that we're called to experience more and more and to 
trust that it is God's nature to heal. And his, his love that continues to heal. And, even, and from my own experiences of times I've needed to forgive those who have hurt me in, in different ways, um, to be able to say that there's freedom in the forgiveness. There's freedom in asking for God's blessing upon those who have hurt me. And there's freedom in ask, receiving God's blessing as his beloved son. And asking for the, knowing even from those places of hurt that those even become places of healing that then I can bring to others. That just as I was able to find healing in the perfectionism, I've been able to I'm able to relate to those in the midst of that. And so just letting Jesus, is helping us be wounded healers and being able to know from our wounds comes healing and comes grace. And that's important, that we want to seek truth together and seek this love together and build that, build that love up. And that love comes through forgiveness and comes through faith that only God himself can give and that when I found it hard to pray that prayer myself, I just say, okay, Jesus, pray that prayer through me. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And so letting that forgiveness bring us this freedom, this life. What do you say, Bill, to people who want to go deeper but don't know how? Yeah, I think, I think the step, first step is Finding where have others gone? Where have others um, found that strength, found that life? Um, I think one of the things that we're blessed with is the history of faith, the history of those who have gone before us, um, the history of, of the saints, history of um, you know, recent church leaders, and being able to delve into that and finding those same points where they found themselves clueless, not knowing where to go. Um, so I think being able to seek those resources, seek those blessings, and know that as we trust that those who have gone before us are with the Lord and that their guidance can still be with us and their prayers can still be with us. So I think just seeking out a community of faith that can help provide those same resources, provide the same encouragement. Um, so and then if there's nothing right in the immediate area, maybe to do a little searching through the internet or searching faith, but knowing even just through this podcast or through other things that we're brought bringing people together. And so just those opportunities I think one of the things that strikes so me just seeing it out about what you're saying. Too, just praying to God openly and honestly, okay. hey, God, bring people in my life who can help lead me even more deeply to you, who can lead me more deeply in this world. Because I found Myself, and that's, okay. as I've See. prayed that in the past, that's where the friends, these friends, have come into my life in that deeper way. Oh. And that, as we look into scripture, as we look in the Bible, just the richness of faith, and to not like, I catch myself thinking, okay, I've read the Bible a good amount, so like, okay, I don't think I need to go back there. But <laughs> realizing, no, there's always like, there's more in the scriptures, there's more. Even just lingering upon the words, lingering upon the stories imagining these stories, placing myself um, within them. I was really blessed. A couple of years ago, I got to do a 30-day a retreat. It's called The Spiritual Exercises. Um, that's written by St. Ignatius of Loyola from the 1500s. Um, but just one of the things he says is to imagine the scripture story, imagine the senses, imagine everything happening, and place yourself in that. What's the conversation like with Jesus or with the apostles or with those who are there with Mary? And just in order to be able to see how that unfolds in our mind. So the gift of Christian imagination, the gift of prayer. And so just seeing that there's again, always more to delve into through the Bible, through those who have been inspired by the Bible, and then the community of faith from that. Here's what strikes me, okay? Because some of us have these testimonies where all of a sudden this big huge moment like special effects when all of a sudden the light dawns and we go from darkness to light and wow there's god and everything changes and that was kind of mine and that was several people that we've listened to okay and in your case bill it's like this progressive journey where god is taking you by the hand right a progressive journey of love going deeper into his heart 
Okay. Just day by day, step by step. Mm. And I love the fact that he does it so differently with all of us. And I think to me, the significance of it is, is that if you haven't had that big moment of being shot into space on a rocket with God, as I'll call it, <laughs> it doesn't mean that it's any less real, any less important. You're not second class because I'm mm -hmm. listening to your journey and I'm in awe of not only how God took you step by step, but the fact that you, you, you recognized it as he was taking you step by step. These little moments and these seemingly little things, which obviously weren't little, you, you seem to be able to recognize his love and his goodness throughout your whole journey. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's continuing to happen, even from what has happened these past five years as a priest. If, like, I wouldn't have anticipated much, if any of it, in terms of the friendships and the connections and deepening and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and seeing how this can communicate it, seeing the miracles of healing. Of, Speaking God's word, seeing the miracles of, of God coming alive within parishioners here, and that God, yeah, just so the surrender of what leads has led me in the surrender of saying, Okay, Lord, I surrender myself to you, take care of everything. Um, saying, okay, I want to see even in these moments of grace, and, and then growing in that trust where, thanks be to God, I'm not as disrupted or disturbed by some of those like little inconveniences that can happen. Um, but I'm just simply saying the trust, okay, God is taking care of so much else and he'll continue to do so and he'll continue to bring this even more fully into him. And so that's been, I think, the continuing development and the grace and the thanks be God that for the foundation of the church, foundation of life, and being able to share that with so many people through faith, through the sacraments, through prayer, through teaching, um, and just... Yeah, the awe and wonder that I continue to experience um, and see come alive in others. Well, that's a good point, though. You know, it's, uh, I think people think that God always comes with a trumpet blast, you know, but it's, it's often in the little decisions and the little things, you know, that our faith is built. And you, you, uh, another thing that I keep hearing you say is this progressive surrender of everything. You know, because Jesus is, you know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, <laughs> praying, not, you know, not my will, but yours be done. But I mean, that's what it eventually is, is the journey of surrender, letting God be God. And it's in the little things. So I love that. So yeah. would you like to add anything before we ask you to pray? No, no, I think you know, very well covered a lot. And of course, there's so much more beyond that. And I think I pray as we discover the greater unity in Christ, we continue to share those gifts that he gives, the gift of faith, the gift of communion, and the gift of seeing the gifts of the Holy Spirit come alive even more. And just, I'm so grateful for your own example of reaching out and seeing that and um, being able to well, I'm looking forward to, to a, more of a focus on what we have in common rather than what we have different, you know? Yeah, certainly, yes. So can you lead people either to accept Christ or to rededicate their lives to Christ, whichever situation they might be in? Certainly, yeah. I think just to recognize maybe just where in our lives right now we need him, we need God. We can't do it on our own, and knowing that this is the, that God delights in this. He's not a slavish father, just someone's just throwing graces down from heaven every so often. No, he's the loving father who embraces us as his children. But no matter what we've done or what we're doing right now, that is keeping us away from his love. That he forgives. That he invites us into his repentance. And he invites us into his surrender to his faith. Excuse me, I'm going to take some water before I have some bread. So just trusting that he reaches, he's reaching out to you even now and offering his forgiveness, offering his new life, whether for the first time or the thousandth time, just that we can acknowledge him as king, welcome him into our hearts, 
and say, Jesus, I surrender myself to you. So if you'd like to pray this with me, I just invite you to place yourself in God's presence and his love, his love that is always there, that he calls you his. Heavenly Father, we entrust ourselves to you at this moment. Just ask me, you open our eyes, open our hearts to see your love, your providence poured out, given more and more. We thank you for the blessings of our lives, for each breath we take, for every person of love surrounding us. And Father, we ask forgiveness, both for asking the forgiveness for the ways we've sinned, the ways we've turned away from you. And we ask that we may forgive as you forgive. To forgive those who have hurt us or those who have not shown us that love. And Father, we repent of all those things that we know keep us in slavery to sin. And Father, we invite your son Jesus into our hearts. We ask that he baptize us in his Holy Spirit and unite us with himself in his love. And as he floods our hearts, we may return the sacrifice of praise as a gift of ourselves, as a gift of offering. Father, we ask that you help us surrender each and every moment of our lives to you, that we may experience your peace in your life. Protect us from any influence of the evil one, that we may follow you more, that Jesus, you may continue to bless us in everything. Through the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming on. I want to thank you particularly for just your honesty and just taking us through the whole journey. And um, so just thank you for coming on today. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks again for the invitation. And thank you, all you listeners out there. I hope you guys enjoyed Father Bill and were blessed by all he had to share. And we'll see you guys again next time on the Grace Chronicles.